I, I came to classical Christian education with very little classical Christian experience. Um, and that's true of many of our teachers. And so we went to uh, teach them, do a good job of teaching our teachers and our staff the curriculum that we follow, um, the pedagogy of classical Christian education, because there's a lot of uniqueness to what we're doing. Um, and then what we also sort of, the conclusion that we reached is that we need to um, probably be a little bit more formal in how we train our parents, our blended parents in particular, on the curriculum and the pedagogy. And so the result of that desire is blended you. And this first uh, session will uh, cover the topic of math and focus, math and focus curriculum. We'll look at Latin, I believe, in November, um, and then hit some other curriculums as we move through the year. I think there'll be five total this year. And we plan to do this every year, uh, with, with hopefully, especially for our new families, um, that they can take advantage of it. Um, but not only do we want to help you with the mechanics of the curriculum, we also want this to be an encouragement for you. Um, I was mowing the yard. It's getting darker earlier. <laughs> I, I realized that as I was mowing, because it was starting to get really dark quick on me. Um, but one of the things I like about mowing the yard is that there are, there's clear, it's a clear way to track your progress. And at the end of the, when there's no more lines left to mow, you're done. And if there's like a little bit of satisfaction in the freshly mowed yard. Education and child rearing are not like that <laughs> at all. And so um, it just minutes like serving people, working with people is not like that. It's not, you can't see the progress in the same way. And so hopefully um, you're encouraged by this. And, and you come away with a sense of, okay, we're on the right track. Um, the lines are getting mowed in the life of <laughs> our children. So um, that's the purpose. I'm going to pray. And then Mrs. Thompson, our fourth and fifth grade teacher at the Rock Campus, will, will lead us. And we also have, helping us out today, Mrs. Despain, who teaches first grade at our North Campus. And Mrs. Krejci is just joining us, and she teaches upper school math at the academy. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your gifts. We thank you for uh, all the things that you're doing at this school. And the reason why uh, ministry and discipleship are not like mowing yards is because you, um, you are at work, but you're at work in a hidden fashion. And we pray that we would be confident and faithful of the good work that you're doing in our children uh, in and through us, help us to lean heavily into you as we raise these children. We pray that this math and focus training would be helpful, uh, the parents would come away with, with help and guidance, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys all for coming. <coughs> I am Allison Thompson. I've, I do, right, this year I teach fourth and fifth grade traditional. Um, I also, in the past, have taught third grade when we were doing primary primary math and I've been principal so I've been in lots of classrooms seeing how um, primary math was impl implemented and I love math and I hope that I can express some of that to you guys today and give you sort of an enthusiasm for math and focus and Singapore math in general. So let's begin. Um, so first off I want to answer the question what is math and focus? Math and focus is essentially a Singapore math curriculum. It's written by a lot of Singaporean people, and it's written for Americans. So primary math was a little different in that it was the Singaporean curriculum, um, basically just translated into English and then sort of written with some, a little bit of teacher helps. Um, but math and focus, and Singapore math in general, it focuses on deep understanding of numbers and math concepts. It, they don't want just answer getting, they want problem solvers. So they won't just teach a, a few steps to get a problem, they'll teach multiple ways to get a problem and a deep understanding of what those problems are asking and what the answers are trying to get at. Um, one thing that is true across all Singapore curriculum is that there are three stages in the learning process. The first is the concrete stage where you're actually touching objects. So the concrete is that you're looking at things and moving things around. 
Um, the pictorial stage is where they're looking at pictures of things that could be moved around. So they might look, turn to their textbook after they do an activity with actual manipulatives. They look in their textbook and see those, that activity played out in a picture form for them. And then they move into the abstract, or maybe what that would be is doing the algorithm or looking at just numbers and not pictures. So the concrete to pictorial to abstract is a benchmark of all Singapore curriculum, and we think it's really important. So I was even just talking to Mrs. Despain earlier this morning. She's like, every day we get out our manipulatives. And as they get older, it's a little bit less, but I am getting out manipulatives at least several times a week, if not every day, and it's important. The kids have to be able to see the actual things moving in order to have a deep understanding of math. Um, I touched on this a minute ago, but how this curriculum is different than primary math, which is what we were using last year and for the last four years, I believe, before that. Um, there, it, the concepts are the same, and in fact, most of the ways that they teach it is the same, but there is just so many more resources. So our teacher manuals for primary math were very small. They didn't give a lot of instruction on how to teach things. There were some mistakes in them. Our teacher materials now are very in-depth. They give ideas for how to teach kids who are struggling, how to teach kids who are advanced, how to, all of these different ideas. It's much more thorough. Um, we have the resource of it's called the reteach book. And so you may have seen these as parents. If a, if a student or a class is not grasping a concept, the teacher can send home the reteach section of that lesson. The reteach just goes through the same material with a lot of examples at a slower pace, sometimes with simpler numbers. So instead of multiplication with sevens, eights, and nines, they're moving back and doing multiplication with just twos and threes, where it might be just easier for the children to understand. So the reteach is a huge resource, and I feel like that has helped me as a teacher. I hopefully you guys have seen that reteach come home. It's also great for teaching parents. If you don't understand the concept and you can't get it by looking at the textbook, then the reteach is really helpful. Um, teachers also have an enrichment book, so the kids who are needing a little bit of extra um, challenge, they ha they can pull out those. Also, it's good for just your whole class. Like, I use the enrichment every so often. I pull out a problem, and we just puzzle over it for a while. I think it's good for the kids to realize that it's worth the struggle, even if you don't always get the answer. The struggle is worth it. Um, there's better student resources. So the textbooks for, for Math and Focus are so useful. If you're, if you're having trouble at home, on a workbook exercise and you don't have the textbook there with you, um, you need the textbook. Have your kids bring the textbook home every single day because they need to be able to look at the textbook to see the examples and see how they learned it at school. Because as much as they're paying attention at school, they're gonna forget things by the time they get home and start, start working it. So the, the student textbook is a huge resource. Um, we also have more support for teachers, so we were able to do a math and focus training. Many of you went to the training for parents that we offered at the very beginning of the summer, but we have contact with the people at math and focus, so if teachers have questions, we have someone to go to, which wasn't the case with primary math. So this is a really great step for, for us as teachers and for you guys too, for, and for the students. So when I was preparing for this, I asked all of the teachers at the South and kind of got ideas from other, other teachers. What do we need to tell parents at the different ages, at different age levels? And so when I was talking to the teachers of early grades, one thing that they said was, use manipulatives at home every day. So don't start math until you have a pile of beans next to you. Because the beans, I, it doesn't need to be anything fancy, you just need something to represent the numbers that you're working with. Because until students re understand that six is six beans, or six coins, or six blocks, and how can they manipulate those six items, they're not really going to understand six and what it is. Um, 
So along those lines, practice breaking numbers apart and putting them back together. So ask them, what is six? It's one and five. It's two and four. It's three and three. And so you get this overall feeling of how this number can be broken up and put back together. Do that with every single number. The first grade curriculum walks you through that, but you have to continue it throughout the year. And this is really the key to understanding addition and subtraction, is to be able to break a number apart and put it back together. So that when you're looking at six plus eight, we know we may have memorized six plus eight is 14, and kids can memorize that also, but it'll be so much more useful to them, especially when you get into third grade and you're doing mental math, to know that, okay, six needs four ones in order to get up to 10. So six plus four is 10, and then we have four left over, and 10 and four is 14. In, that seems like a long way to say it, but eventually that becomes natural, and they're able to, to break apart a number and put it back together and, and do that mental math very easily and quickly. But we have to make them do it. So it might be easier at first to memorize six plus eight is 14, but learn every strategy for doing that. Um, also encourage your child to use math language correctly. Talk about math using math terms. Talk about sums and differences. In the older grades, talk about products and quotients. And I still have fourth graders who will say, let's plus those numbers. <laughs> I'm like, we're going to add the numbers, not plus them. Or they'll say, and times this by this. I'm like, no, multiply this by this. So using the correct terms is really important. Play games. You can play math games, but play any game and make it into a math game. So. In my house, we have a game called Pass the Pigs. Has anyone ever played Pass the Pigs? So you roll the pigs, and they land in various ways, and it earns you points. It's really hilarious. Like, you can get a snouter. Snouters are worth, whatever, 20 points or 40 points. I don't know. But you have to add, and some things are worth one point or two points. So that puts you, if you're at 37 and you have to add five, 37, 42, 45, and you learn this pattern of adding five. So, Think about playing lots of games with your kids. Not only is it fun, it's great family time, but you are building critical thinking and problem solving in your kids. And it's a fun way to spend time with them. Also look for deeper level thinking opportunities when you're doing math with your kids. So if they get an answer, ask them, how did you do that? It may be the easiest thing. They've added their number. How did you do that? They should be able to say, well, I just memorized that fact. Okay, well is there another way that you could have thought about that? Um, in, in our math and focus training, the instructor emphasized there's always five ways to do a problem in, on a good day. So think about how you can ask your kids, is there another way you could do that? Is there another way you could approach this problem? How did you get that? Get them talking about math, because when they can talk about it, they can think about it. Moving into first and second grade, um, it's important, I think I said this already, but it's important to learn every strategy for solving a problem. One way might be easier for you or easier for, for your child, but every strategy is important because they might need it later on and they might find that it actually is really useful later as they get into their into higher level math. Again, continue to work on breaking apart numbers and putting numbers back together. <clears throat> Learning tens. How to make a 10, so important. Making a 10 is, is huge. And I would play a game with my students where I say, okay, I say two, you say, and they say eight. I say three, you say seven. I say one, you say nine. So that we're always getting that how to make a number. If you can make tens, then you can make hundreds. And then that becomes a huge key in mental math. Um, once your child understands, oh wait, yeah, once your child understands how addition and subtraction works, have your child work to memorize and become more fluent, fluent in their math fact recall. This is huge because when you get into doing long division, lots of digits of multiplication, if you're struggling, if you're having to stop and think, what is seven times eight? And you're having to count, then by the time you figure out the answer, you're gonna have forgotten where you are in that problem. Plus, it's just grueling to do 
10 long division problems if you don't know your math facts. It is, oh, I've, we've been struggling with that in my class this year, and it's just hard. So we want kids to understand where the math facts are coming from. We want them to have lots of strategies to come up with their, their answer, strategies beyond counting on their fingers. Um, and then we want them to be fast, because that will make math more fun and easier. I mean, once you learn, don't you guys all remember learning your math facts? Learn it, be, going through the multiplication drills. It was hard at the time, but aren't you glad you don't have to count on your fingers to figure out what seven times eight is? It's so nice. It makes math so much more fun. So really make your kids do it. Singapore does not have, Singapore curriculums do not have a ton of math fact practice built into the curriculum. In, I was told that in Singapore, this is something parents do with their kids from the time they're tiny. They're teaching them math facts. Um, we need to be good about doing that as parents, that we're helping our kids know their math facts, doing whatever it takes. There are great online games, there are flashcards, there's drill pages. There's lots of ways to do it. We want them to have the strategies for doing it, but then we want them to be fast at it. Then we get into second through fifth grade, and I think this is where the rubber hits the road. I mean, we are really needing to understand math in order to do math in second through fifth grade, particularly fourth and fifth, and then on up into middle school. You have to have it, the kids have to have a really good basis in math understanding in order to succeed and to really see how, how math works in these grades. So continue to establish their math facts. They, they may need help, especially over the summer, just retaining those so that they come back into school and they know, they know their math facts. Um, mental math is a big deal in these grades. Place value is huge and word problems are huge. These are all making them problem solvers. All these things make them problem solvers and not answer getters. These are the strategies. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time doing problems now. So it's time for your math lesson. Um, starting with mental math. Okay. First problem up here is 73 plus 99. I'm going to write stuff down. This would all be done in their heads, right? But we're thinking, when we think 73 plus 99, we're really thinking 73 plus 100 minus one. And that's so much easier than, usually kids see this problem, and some adults too, and they think, I just need to do it like this, and then I can carry, and I can get this number, right? But what we're saying is just think, 173 minus one, 172. It's so much faster and easier when you can do it that way. Okay. The next one is 54 plus 67. There are a couple ways that, that Singapore, I mean, there's always lots of ways to do it, right? So one way to look at this, 54 plus 67, one way to do it is to add the tens and add the ones. So in, this is all happening in our heads, right? But I'm writing it down so you can see my thought process. If you have five tens and six tens, you have 11 tens which is 111. And if you have four ones and seven ones, you have 11 ones. And you can think, adding these together in your head, 121. That's actually a pretty easy addition, right? So that's one way. In your head, you're thinking 110 plus 11 is 121. Another way to think about this is they like to do, start with 54, and they show it I think they show it this way. We didn't do this in fourth grade this year yet. Add 60 first, and then add seven. So 54 plus 60 is 114, plus seven is 121. So do it in steps in your head. And it's kind of the same with subtraction. This sort of was revolutionary to me. Because this is the type of problem that kids always have trouble using the algorithm because of the borrowing. 
right? If you are doing traditional, just like, oh yeah, I've got to do the algorithm and put your 84 here, you're going to have to borrow, kids get confused, and then you're going to have, you're going to have a harder time, right? But if you think of it, I mean, there's lots, there's lots of ways to think of this problem in mental math. Um, I personally like 200 minus 80 is 120. 120 minus 4 is 116. That's an easy in your head without getting too confused kind of way. Um, you could also think 84 is only 16 away from 100. So you could think subtract 100, add back 16. Um, there's probably other ways. So that's one, a couple strategies. Uh, the next one, eight, 584 minus 98. Again, we're almost to 100, so we can subtract and then add back in. The kids need, they sometimes get confused with this. Do we subtract and then subtract again? The point is that they need to not be thinking about the steps, because we don't want them to learn steps. We want them to really understand what they're doing, right? So we're subtracting 100, but it's not quite 100, so we're going to be, a, we're going to have to add back some numbers after we subtract 100. Have your students try and verbalize these to you. All right, another, another hallmark, I guess, of Singapore, especially at the older grades, is place value. Really at every grade, but where they really start using it and it becomes critical is here at the older grades. We want them to understand exactly what they're doing when they're adding and using an al algorithm or subtracting or multiplying. So I wanted to show you these problems in, using a place value chart. So the first one, 78 plus 185. I'm going to write it. Actually, let's write it over here. We can do it that way. OK. Do you guys all know, are you familiar with the place value charts? You've seen these in your textbooks? Um, <coughs> We have really great ones that we can use in our classroom, and we have disks that we move around, um, or uh, blocks that go together. But for the purpose of this, we'll just write it. So our first number, well, okay, let's represent 78. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And here's our second number, 100. And five. Now we all probably, if you're like me, you learned, okay, first you add this column, and it's A plus five is 13, so we put the three here and we write a one up here. We carry the one. What does that mean? If our kids just learn the steps, they don't have any concept of what that actually means. And so what we do is we say, okay, let's add the ones together. So now we've gotten rid of our divider here, we've got how many ones do we have? Count them. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. We have 13 ones. What is 13 ones? We can't have 13 in the ones column. 13 ones is really 10 ones and 3 ones, right? Or 1, 10, and 3 ones. So we can take 10 of these, and they become a 10. So really what we have when we say A plus 5 is 13 is we have 3 ones and one ten. We've renamed the ten one or the thirteen ones into three ones and one ten. Now we can count all of our tens. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. We could also say seven plus eight is fifteen, plus one is sixteen. So we're there. Sixteen tens. What is sixteen tens? Well, ten tens is a hundred. So we have one hundred and six tens. So, let's find our tens. It's four, five, six, and eight. Here's our ten tens. We'll trade out for a hundred. And here's our five, no, six tens and one hundred. 
Now we just add our two hundreds together. We have two hundred. Two hundred. So yes, the algorithm ends up looking just the same as if we said we carried the one. We carried the one. But when you do it with a place value chart, the students understand why we do that. Why do we do that? And it, that's important for them to understand. We can do the same thing with a subtraction problem. So, 402 minus 88. Okay, 402 minus 88. Well, first we need to subtract the ones, but we have a problem here because we don't have enough ones to take eight away from it. You can't take eight away from two. What are we gonna do? Well, we could trade in our tens, but we don't have any tens, do we? <laughs> so we have to take out one of our hundreds. We're gonna trade that in for tens. How many tens are in a hundred? 10. So we write our tens. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we have 10 tens now. Now we can take one of our tens and trade it in for ones. So now, what do we have? We have 12 ones, and we have three hundreds and nine tens. Now we can do some math. So we want to take the eight away. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we want to take away 8 from this one, too. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then we get our number. We have 3 hundreds, 1, 10, and 4 ones. Is this making sense? Yes? Okay. Let's do a multiplication problem. Or 342 times 3. So, <clears throat> alright. We're going to multiply it. That means that we're basically adding 342 plus 342 plus 342. And we could just draw them in. We're multiplying here. So this is our answer, right? We already have it all multiplied. But there are some problems here in that we have too many tens here. We can't have more than nine tens in any, or more than nine disks in any slot. Um, so we're looking at our ones first. We have six ones. We can just leave those there. There's no renaming needed. But here, we want to look and say, okay, we've got 12, so we'll take 10 of those and trade them in for one more. So we've got four times three is two tens and one hundred. Two tens and one hundred. Now we have our three times three is nine. That's our original ones here. One, three, six, and nine. And here's our extra one that was up here. So that's ten. And that is one thousand and zero. If we were really going to rename these, we'd put these over and we've got 1,000, zero hundreds, two tens, and six ones. You guys think this is cool? I think this is so cool because I never got this as a, as a kid. I didn't know why I was putting that one up above my problems. I knew you were supposed to do it and it got the right answer, but I didn't understand why. I didn't, I didn't get it. All right, here's the next one, the last one, a division problem, 534 divided by 3. 
So, and I had, I actually have kids that will say, Mrs. Thompson, can I get out of a place value chart to work this one out. If they're, if they're having some confusion, it, it actually helps them to try it on the place value chart. And so you can do this at home. This works really great on a whiteboard. You could make a place value chart easily and get out some beans to use in it. There's lots of ways to do it. Okay, we have 530 and 4. And so unlike the other ones where we started with the ones, we're going to start with the tens and divide it out. If I am going to divide this into three different groups, and I have five, I'm going to start writing them. One, two, three. That is all I can do evenly, right? And I have two left over, four or five. So I'm going to trade those two in for tens. So if I have two hundreds, I'm going to have twenty ones, or twenty tens. And I also have three tens up here. So that's 23 tens. Is everyone tracking with me? So I've got 23 that I have to divide out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Oh, I'm going to run out. So I have two left, right? Two tens going to be 20, 20, and four ones, which is 24. And now I can sort these out, 24. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 24. We've done it. We've divided it all out. But let's look at what that would look like here. If we do this using our algorithm, we're saying three. How many times can you divide three into five? Just one time, one group, one in each group, right? That gives us three hundreds, right? Three hundreds total that we've used up. Now we're left with 234 to still divide out. How many times can you divide 23, or how many will you, how many in each group if you divide 23 tens by three? Well, we come up with seven. So that is seven times three, which is 20, 210. Seven tens times three is 210. And then you can subtract, and that's left us with 24 ones. And when we divide 24 ones into equal groups, we get eight in each group. Eight ones and three times three is 24, and we don't have any left over. So it brings a whole new thing, a whole new vision to the divide, multiply, subtract, bring down method, right? Because we're actually seeing what we're doing here. Now at some point, the, this little motto is going to be helpful to help them make sure they've kind of done every step, but under, the deep understanding is really important. Okay, we're going to just plow ahead so we can get through all the examples. And then we'll ask questions here in a minute. That brings us to bar modeling. This is at the key of true problem solving. Um, most, under, most problems are best understood with a bar model, a table, or some kind of pictorial representation of the information that we know. So math and focus, they teach the Ploya's four-step approach to word problems, which is first, understand the problem. If you don't know what the problem is saying or asking, you're going to have a hard time solving it. I have so many kids that are like, they'll read the problem and they'll say, oh, so this is addition. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. You haven't even thought about what this problem is saying first. What do you know? So for that step, I always ask my kids, what do you know? 
from this problem. The next step is devise the plan. This is where you transfer what you know into a pictorial plan of some sort. Next is carry out the plan. That's where you look at your bar model or your picture and you say, what is my algorithm going to be based on this picture? And then go back and examine your solution. Does my answer make sense? You have to ask that question. Or at the very least, also go back and look at your problem. Am I answering what the problem actually asked? Because lots of kids get to an answer and they think, well, that's the final answer. But the, the problem actually is asking a few different things. So let's look at some different ones. And I think if you can learn to identify the different types of bar models, it will help you help your kids draw the bar models to go with the problems. So the first problem says this. Sarah and Henry are both selling candy bars for a school fundraiser. Sarah sold 24 candy bars and Henry sold 49 candy bars. How many did they sell all together? How many more bars did Henry sell? So this is going to require two different types of bar models to answer these two questions. The first one is just a normal addition bar model. Where you've got two parts and then this is the whole. So it's asking us how many did they sell all together. One part is 24 and one part is 49. They don't need to be like perfect like size or anything like that. I just tell my kids, get it up there. When you see a model like this, it should scream addition to you and to your kids. If they're not getting it with bigger numbers like this, do something smaller and say, okay, if this is two and this is three, how much is this? And they'll say five. They automatically see that. So if this is five, how did you get to five and two and three? Oh, we added them together. Ah, so that's what we need to do up here, add these together. We're not going to come up with the solution. The other type of bar model that is in this problem is a comparison bar model. We're comparing Sarah and Henry and how much they sold. So we've got this. Sarah sold more? No. Henry sold more. So here's Henry and here's Sarah. This is 49 and 24. Our question is, what is this number? How much more? Well, we can quickly see that this is actually the same as the part whole that we just had, right? In order to get this little bit, we have the whole up here, and we have the part here and a part here. So 49 minus this part is going to give us this part. So as your kids see these comparison problems, they should think, this is subtraction. When I see this, it's subtraction. You're comparing. Anytime a question is asking you to compare who has more, what is longer, which one is faster, all of those, you think of a comparison bar model where you're drawing, drawing one on top and the other on bottom, and you're figuring out what is here. OK, our next question says, Bob has two children. The sum of their ages is 15. If Sarah is nine, how old is Henry? Again, we have a part and whole model. What is it? Sarah is. The sum is 15. First off, your kids have to know what sum means. So go over that math vocab with them all the time. Their sum is 15. Sarah is 9. How old is this one? This is what we want to know. We should think this is a part, here is a part, here is the whole. We put two parts together to get the whole, or we can take one part away from the whole to find the other part. This is where, this part and whole is where these, now my mind is blanking on what these are called, Laura. Number bonds. number bonds. This is where number bonds come in. We're basically saying five is here, nine is here, what goes here? Okay. Moving on. Okay. Now this is the new kind of bar model. Kevin packs four bags of apples. Each bag contains 15 apples. How many apples does he have all together? This is an equal parts bar model. Equal parts, when you see equal parts, 
in a problem, it is always indicating multiplication or division. So the question is, which one is this? We have four bags, and each one has 15. How many does he have all together? We're looking for the whole here. So we can do 4 times 15 to find this, which is 60. You could do this with bigger numbers. So when you get into higher grades, they're saying, the farmer had a whole lot of apples, and he put 15 in each bag. How, well, hold on. So let's say he had 25 bags of apples. We're not going to draw 25 little lines. 25 bags. It's still a multiplication problem, but you don't have to draw all the lines. Just put one so you can tell that this is an equal part. This is 15. And there are 25 parts. It's enough to just write that. Good? Okay. Here's another. Bob has two children. The sum of their ages is 20. Henry is four years older than Sarah. How old are Henry and Sarah? This is one where you're like, oh, what is this even asking? So first we say, what do we know? There's two kids. Together, they're 20. But Henry's four years older. That sounds like a comparison problem to me, where we know a difference, right? We have Henry and Sarah. We know that this number here is four. And we know that all together, it's 20. So, if we take this, this part is also 4, right? So, if we take 4 away from this and 4 away from our total, so we have then 16, and this is an equal parts problem, right? And we just divide it, divide 16 by 2, so we have 8 on each one. Well, we know that the short one is 8, and this long one is... 8 plus 4. Then we could go back and ask, does this make sense? So if this child is 12 and this child is 8, do their ages add up to 20? They do. So our problem makes sense. Our answer makes sense. And this is a multi-step problem. They like to throw these in. And as you get, as kids get better and better with word problems, they're expecting them to do many steps with it. Okay. A farmer sells lettuce to three different local restaurants. If he grows 525 heads of lettuce and divides his produce equally, how many heads will each restaurant receive? So, here's all of his produce, right? We know how much he grew, 525. And then he divided it into three equal parts. How much is this part? When your kids see this kind of thing, they should think, aha, a division problem. This is division. If they say, it's multiplication, you say, okay, so what are you going to multiply? 3 times 525. Okay, let's estimate that in our heads. 3 times 500 is going to be 1,500. Does this make sense? The farmer takes 525 heads of cabbage, and he divides it up equally. Now this one farmer is going to have 1,500 cabbages. Does that make sense? Can you get 1,500 cabbages out of 525 cabbages? You're going to be like, no. I'm like, well, you must have chosen the wrong strategy. You must have looked at this problem wrong. So go back and try something different. So a lot of times if my kids are thinking along the wrong way, I'll say, okay, let's think about what would happen if we did that. Let's estimate. There's a lot of estimating that happens in fourth and fifth grade and see if it works out. Okay, here's another one. Rena has a roll of ribbon 250 centimeters long. She cuts it into a number of pieces that are 20 centimeters each. How many pieces can she cut and how much ribbon will be left over? Well, we know that she has a certain amount of ribbon, the whole amount, and that is 250, 250 centimeters. She's going to cut it into a bunch of pieces. And they're all going to be how long? 20 centimeters. 
Do we know how many pieces she's going to cut up? We don't really know. That's where our question mark is. Question mark pieces. I just like to write it in there. We know that eventually we're going to divide it up, but we don't know how many little lines to draw, so it's not helpful. We also know that there's going to be some left over. We don't know how much, but eventually we'll cut it all up and there'll be a little bit left over. So what kind of problem is this? We know how many, how much each equal part is, but we don't know the number of equal parts. That tells us it should scream division, because we've seen a lot of division problems by the time we get to fifth grade. But hopefully, if it doesn't, we would say 250 times 20, that doesn't make any sense. That's going to be way too long. So let's divide it. And you get that it goes 12 times, and there's 10 left over. This is where we're, they're, they're learning about remainders and how the remainder has a function. So there, there's 12 pieces, 10 left over. I think we have two more problems. You guys are starting to look a little bit like my fifth graders. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> okay. When I teach this, it is not me up here explaining it really fast for them. I'm drawing it out of them, but we don't have time to do that for you guys today because I want you to have lots of questions and times for answers. So know that this is not how it's being taught to your children. Just look here, this is how you do it. They're actually working it out with their teachers together. Okay. Another type of problem that you see is that like this person is three times older. So like this problem, John is three times older than Ted. The sum of their ages is 60. So this bar model looks like this. I always say, okay, figure out who the smallest, like the smallest thing, whatever that is. So that's um, Ted. Ted is the young one. And John is three times older. So you just draw three of these. One, two, three. That's how I draw them. And then, this is John. And I forget their names. Jim. No, John. Okay. And together, we know how much they, how much, how old they are, which is 60. Well, look at this. These are all equal parts, aren't they? Because we know this is equal to this, and these are just the same. So we have four equal parts, and we know all together it's 60. So this is a division problem. We want to find out how many equal parts, or how much is an equal, each equal part. So if this is 15, now we know we need to find this. If this is 15 and we have three 15s, that's basically 15 plus 15 plus 15, or 15 times 3, which is 45. OK? Wait, I mean, how did you get to 15? Oh, that's fine. I'll do it again. OK. Because we know the total is 60, and there's four equal yeah, parts. So the trick, always look for that so-and-so okay. -so has three times as many blah, blah, blah. That, that's always a sign that you're going to draw something like this. OK. This is our last question. This one puzzled us last week. So. Hector, Teddy, and Jim scored a total of 4,670 points playing a video game. Teddy scored 316 points less than Hector. Teddy scored three times as many points as Jim. How many points did Teddy score? This is like, I, I have parents all the time. When I was principal, they'd say, this is, this is stuff that my son is doing in algebra too. I'm like, it might be, but this it can be solved using a picture. Believe it or not, it can be solved using a picture. You do not need to know algebra to solve this problem. And in fact, it's way easier just to solve it using a picture. So you've got to take what you know. We know the total was 4,670. We know that um, Teddy scored three times as many points as Jim. I like to start there because we know what that picture looks like. We've got one. Here's Jim. Oh, sorry. Here's Teddy. Teddy is three times as many. And then we know Hector scored more than that even, right? Teddy scored 316 less points than Hector. 
So we know it's longer, right? And we know these are still equal parts, right? But this one is not equal. This is 316. At least we don't know that it's equal, at least. All right. So all together, we know that these are 4,670. 4, we know that these are all equal, and this one is not equal. So we've got to get rid of it, right? We need to subtract it from Hector's score. And if we subtract 316 from Hector's score, their total score is going to go down by 316, right? So we subtract 316. Hopefully my math is good. I'm under pressure. So we get 4,354. 4, so that is without this. Now, we just have an equal parts problem. And we've got seven into seven equal parts. If we divide this big number by seven, it'll give us what one equal part is. And at that point, then we just have to figure out Teddy's score, which is three equal parts whatever the, the total is. OK. There are way more types of, I, mean, I would say there's not many more types of bar models. There's just more combinations, because then they start putting them together. You've got addition and subtraction and multiplication and division all in one problem. Sometimes for each problem, you have to draw, for one problem, you have to draw multiple bar models to figure out what the problem is asking. Sometimes you have to try different ones, because it doesn't work out at first. So there, it, it can get a lot more complicated, but essentially you're using all of these same strategies when you're drawing pictures. And there are also times where you might draw a table and you're just doing sort of trial and error 